Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank uh, the CC group for inviting me to give you guys this lecture. Um, <clears throat> I do things, I don't know if you've, if you've been to my lectures before, I do things a little bit differently uh, than most surgery lecturers. I've kind of got away from the uh, strict PowerPoint type presentation. I, I kind of have this feeling, this strong feeling that if you're learning a technical skill, it's, it's really hard to learn that skill if you're looking at a picture. And it's even more difficult if you're looking at an artist's conception of what you are supposed to be learning. And in most textbooks uh, and even slides that you take pictures of textbook pictures, um, those are not done by veterinarians. Those are done by medical illustrators who often can't always capture <clears throat> the, what the speaker's trying to do. So anyway, after all that, what I have done over the last probably 20 or 30 years, I hate to even think it could be 30, but I think it is. Um, I videotape all my clinical cases. So I videotape the surgery in my operating room theater so these are all live animals that have a client attached to them um, that I am operating and trying to do the best job I can <clears throat> to get that patient off the table and to, to get a successful outcome. So I have now incorporated those video uh, clips into uh, educational videos. And so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna operate um, a brachycephalic uh, candidate. And I'm gonna take you into my operating room theater. I'm gonna show you what I do. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the instruments that I like to use. I'm gonna, um, you know, just just try to go from, you know, A to Z and, and try not to miss anything uh, using a clinical case to, uh, to do it. So one thing that I have learned about surgeons is that they are not physiologists. You know, sometimes they cut stuff away and trim stuff and remove stuff, either because it's in the way, because it's there. Um, usually they have a purpose, but sometimes I don't really think that they always know what that, you know, purpose is. Uh, the brachycephalic syndrome uh, was one of those things for me. And, I, and I, let me tell you a little story about what made me think that I might not be such a good guy removing pieces and parts from dogs is I had a client come in with a, a bulldog and this bulldog had brachycephalic syndrome, but he was not a respiratory cripple. He had no uh, signs of um, syncopal attacks or he wasn't cyanotic, he didn't collapse, you know, none of that. He was noisy. He The owner said, I'm bringing my dog to you because this dog is an inconvenience to me. He's noisy and I can't sleep with him. <laughs> I've sort of felt like saying, dude, you got the wrong dog. <laughs> you need to get a different breed. And uh, <clears throat> so I started, I struggled a little bit wondering if it was fair for me to take some pieces and parts out of this dog just to be um, the convenience for the owner. And I, you know, I, I started questioning myself just a little bit. And so I hired a veterinary pulmonologist. Yeah, they're out there. There's two of them that I know of. Philip Padrid and I um, can't remember the other guy's name, but um, I belong to this little group called the Soft Tissue Surgeries, part of the American College of Veterinary Surgeons. So we meet every, every year and we usually have a, a specific topic that we talk about. And one year we hired a pulmonologist to come and, and educate us about the physiology of the airway of dogs, and in particular, brachycephalic dogs. So 
I was very interested. Uh, uh, the guy that we hired, his name was Brendan McKernan. So, <clears throat> and he's an internal medicine specialist. That's, that'll become important here in a little bit. So I talked, I said to Brendan, I said, hey, listen, you know, I, I gave him that example case and I said, is it okay for me to disfigure this dog just because it's the, uh, an inconvenience to the client? And he said, absolutely not. Anytime a dog comes into your hospital and he's making noise, he's making noise because he has an abnormal airway and he will continue to make noise and continue to perpetuate the abnormality because the sound that he's making is soft tissue trauma from air turbulent flow. So, you know, Brendan, he says, how he says, I want you to go in, in, into your hotel room, <clears throat> go into the bathroom, look in the mirror and breathe 10,000 breaths making noise. <laughs> he said, after the 10,000th breath, tell me what your throat feels like. And it's, you know, it started to, it started to come clear and, and make sense that noise is coming from turbulent flow that is hitting soft tissues to make that noise. So he says, whatever you, whatever you can do to improve laminar flow in the upper airway of any dog, it just happens to be that brachycephalics are the, the most notable. Anything you can do to improve laminar flow, even if there's still noise, but if you can decrease the noise and improve the flow, he says, you are doing a huge service to both the patient and the client. So that made me feel better, um, especially about some of these inconvenienced dogs that come to your practice. So um, I, I was very happy uh, to hear about that. So um, when you get, it's, it's almost your obligation when you get a, a client that comes in, even for a wellness check, if you get a dog that comes in with a pug, if you get a, a client that comes in with a pug, and you're doing a wellness check and you're doing your physical exam and either you notice that the dog is noisy or the owner notices that the dog is noisy and that might even be a complaint, then it is your obligation to at least educate the client that noise is bad. And if it, there's a treatable problem that the owner should consider <clears throat> having someone treated to try to improve the laminar flow. So I, I thought that was really, I thought that was cool. It was educational for me. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at a case and I'm going to do a, this little uh, Frenchie. And this Frenchie uh, presented to our uh, hospital with a history of making noise. So he's otherwise healthy. He's had no, um, he has had no syncopal attacks. He has never been cyanotic. He's not a respiratory cripple. He is the typical brachycephalic dog that presents to your hospital <clears throat> with noise. And on physical examination, or just looking at him across the room, if you look at his nose, you can see that he has a very narrow slit, which does not allow laminar flow into his nose and probably results in turbulent flow, which is part of his problem. Because once the air comes through his nose, if it's already dancing around, by the time it gets into the back of his throat and starts flapping his, his uh, soft palate, and that's, they're all interconnected together. As you know, they're all interconnected. I want you to, to stare at this guy's nose. Let's see if we can get a close up. Yeah, okay, right there. So the reason I want you guys to stare at this nose is because we are gonna operate this dog. And I want you to memorize what his nose looks like now. 
I'll show you his nose um, a couple of uh, hours post-op and then the next day before he's released to go home. And you can have a mental comparison as to what that might look like. Um, so here he is, his cute little Frenchie making all that noise. You're such a good dog. Look at him. And he's got his little surgeon's cap on. He's all over it. So if you read books, which you should, if you read books, books will give you an idea of how much palate you should take off. And they do it relative to the location of his um, tonsil. Somewhere between the cranial aspect and, of the tonsil and the middle of the tonsil. So to me, there's, there's a variation there. And in my way of thinking, the surgeon can really only make two mistakes. Mistake number one is you don't cut enough of the palate off. Patient wakes up, does not have laminar flow, and is continuing to make noise. The other problem is cutting too much. And if you cut too much, then he may not be able to organize liquids and possibly food to stay out of his nasal cavity. And he might end up with a chronic nasal discharge. So, and, and I think all dogs are different. I mean, all bulldogs are different. All Frenchies are different. And so I think what you need to do is to maybe come up with an idea where you could um, remove the palate on your patient based on your patient and that specific anatomy. So if you anesthetize the, your next 20 dogs for a spay, routine spay, any breed, as long as they're normal. And you look at the relationship of the epiglottis with his palate, you will notice that they, the epiglottis just kisses the palate. There's no overlap of either. They just barely touch. And that's, that makes sense. You don't want to cut off too much palate. You don't want to, uh, but you want to cut enough off to give laminar flow. So why don't we do this? Let's anesthetize a dog with a light general, but enough where you can open his mouth and gently pull his tongue out. Now you need to be careful because what you're going to try to do, you can look at the relationship of his epiglottis with his palate. And you're going to stare at it and you're going to stare at that and you're going to watch his epiglottis touch his palate. You're going to see how much of his soft palate is in his airway. And then you're going to take a little uh, marker. I use a sterile scribe. It doesn't have to be sterile, but it has to be able to make a permanent mark on his wet mucous membrane. And so after I've been staring at his, uh, the activity and relationship of his palate with his epiglottis, then what I'll do is I will take that marker and I will touch the dog's palate in the location where the tip of his epiglottis touches it. Perfect. That mark will now be the mark that I will use to determine how much of this dog's palate that I will remove. So here we're, we're going and I'm, I've made the mark and this dog may have been a little bit light because my mark is a little bit bigger than I'd like, but that's okay, right? It doesn't matter. So you've made your mark and put your pen down, do not go, oh, that's the wrong place. I'll make another mark and then another mark. And then pretty soon the whole dog's palate is purple. So just leave the mark there and this, let the dog breathe, let his anatomy flow, let his tip of his epiglottis, let it touch his palate and memorize the point 
of his epiglottis and where it touches his palate relative to your dot. Your dot could be over here somewhere. And if his palate, or I'm sorry, if his epiglottis touches here, you just memorize, memorize the distance. Now, ideally it's good to put them in about the same place. Don't get me wrong, but you know, you may slip up, but don't panic if you do. So I throw his, his uh, soft palate into his airway, stare at the location of where his epiglottis touches. I spend, a, you know, maybe a minute doing this. And you can see we did a pretty good job. This palate touches just at the top of this part of his blue dot. Now let's look at his tonsil for those people who like to use the tonsil. This dog, you probably would be a little bit closer to the cranial aspect of his tonsil or crypt, maybe a little bit caudal. So you can use that. Absolutely. Those are okay to use. I, I just, this individualizes the whole process a little bit better for me. And it makes me feel more comfortable like I'm, I'm doing a specific surgery for a specific dog. And I'm not just clustering all these dogs into one heap that, because they're not all the same, I don't think. And there he's little palate, absolutely nice. Positioning, <laughs> I am a huge proponent of proper positioning. I have this saying, proper positioning enhances the anatomy. The anatomy gets better. And let's face it, we're working in a place where these two hands, really, there's no room for these guys. So you need to have his head positioned in such a fashion that you can open his mouth and keep it open as wide as you can. And what I'm using is an aluminum uh, they used to call these things ether stands. And I've got his maxillary canines hanging on his ether stand. I have his maxillary canines taped to the second level of the aluminum ether stand. And this stand is actually attached to the table. So he's like eh, hanging on this stand. I've got his mandible opened up as wide as I feel comfortable. And I feel pretty darn comfortable opening him pretty darn far. Again, it's an exposure thing and, and it's very important um, to get the proper exposure. And look, look at that big tongue. So even though I've got him open wide, you're probably looking at this thing going, dude, I can't see anything in there. And you're right, you can't. So one thing that um, that you can do is, is uh, get some appropriate instruments. And this is where I think veterinarians tend to, um, you know, maybe not invest in instruments. And so they will struggle more. You probably get the job done but you struggle more and, you know, possibly putting your patient at risk. So if, if you have a short pair of instruments, like a, uh, what's a good example, brown ants and forceps, they're like five or six inches long. They fit nicely in your hand. And when you take that short instrument and you stick it in this dog's mouth, you're not gonna be able to see anything in this dog's mouth except your big hand. And that's not going to help out. If you had a long forcep, uh, particularly a debakey would be the ideal forcep. And your hands back here and the tip of the forcep is in the dog's mouth. You have an unobstructed visual view of what the tip of that debakey is doing. Eight inch to 10 inch debakey. Put that on your Christmas list. You can get a short debakey, that's fine, and use that for intestinal work, uh, urinary bladder, stomach, blah, blah, blah. 
But anytime you're in a deep cavity or inside a mouth, the longer instrument is the way to go. The other instrument that I use that I like is uh, a long handled curved Metzenbaum scissor. And the curve will, will come clear when we do this case uh, because your arm has to reach in from the side to cut his palate. And if it's a straight Metzenbaum, which you can use, that's fine. It's just harder because your arm has to be like way out here coming into his uh, oral cavity to get a good clean cut on his uh, palate. So um, long handled uh, Metzen bombs, uh, long handled DeBakey forcep, that's, that, that's perfect. To keep his tongue retracted, there's two ways you can do that. If you have a human that can help you, in other words, if you're not solo, if you have the luxury of having uh, an assistant, the assistant can take a ribbon retractor, also called a malleable retractor, and they can hold the base of the tongue down. And while you are doing the surgery, they will retract the tongue away and then you've got great Great visualization. If you don't have a human, you should invest the $18.50 to get this um, tongue retractor. And let me tell you guys a little bit about this. I think it's called a Young's Yes. It's called a Young's Tongue Forcep. You can get them at jorvet.com, Jorgensen Laboratories in Loveland, Colorado. These things are freaking great. Absolutely fantastic. They will hold that tongue in place without a problem at all. They have very thick serrated uh, tips and you can clamp this tongue forcep on any part of your body to prove to yourself that you're not overly traumatizing his tongue. And then you can just tape that Young's forcep right, right to the floor, you know, right to the, the table. And that will pull his tongue out, give enough traction that you can hold his tongue in place. My prep, uh, I am a surgeon. I do believe in aseptic surgery, but I also know that it's, you're not gonna aseptically prep the mouth. So I use a, a product, um, it's a one to 50 betadine solution uh, that I mix and I use that for all mucous membranes, um, oral cavity, um, prepuce, penis, uh, vaginal vault. Um, you can use it for the eye. A 1 to 50 is a non-irritant, but it kills about 90%, 98% of the bacteria, viruses, fungus uh, on contact. So it's not like you have to scrub it. You just basically just um, create contact of the 1 to 50 beta 9 with whatever mucous membrane that you're uh, prepping. So I have my techs um, soak a sponge and, and try to get a little bit of the palate um, um, prepped. Let me show you this one to 50. So these are betadine solution. If you're, if you are a betadine oriented practice, then check your jug of betadine solution, not scrub. See if it is a 10% povidone iodine. 
if it's a 10% povidone iodine, then it's a 1% active iodine. So if all that is true in the product that you uh, purchase, you can mix 20 mLs of that 1% iodine, betadine, uh, povidone iodine, betadine solution with 980 mLs of saline. And you now have a one to 50 uh, prep. And this will kill anything on contact. We use it in wound management. We use it, as I said, oral cavity, uh, prepuce, penis, blah, blah, blah. Anywhere that you think you need to get a aseptic prep that is a slip um, mucous membrane. Um, it's, a, it's a great way to go. All right, so stare at this image, stare at this image right here and try to identify as many anatomic structures as you can. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to do that. Just, you know, there's no test here. Just try to remember why, you know, what, what was the, you know, what is all this anatomy? And I'm doing this for two reasons. One is that you know more than you think. And the second reason and, and um, is that I've changed cameras on you. So I have gone from a wide exposure which allows you to figure out where you are to now I've brought you into this really tight, tight image. And that can sometimes um, confound the whole thing by going, wow, what, is it? what has this guy just done to me? So let's have a look and see how well you did. Here's our blue dot, that's good. Here's his endotracheal tube. I get uh, questions from veterinarians about can you do this with an endotracheal tube in place? Or do you have to do a tracheostomy on these guys? And you do not have to do a tracheostomy. The only time I would do a tracheostomy as a routine is when a dog comes in as a respiratory cripple, he's trying to die, he's cyanotic, he's syncopal. Um, that guy's gonna get a, a tracheostomy. It's not because it makes it easier for me to do the surgery. <clears throat> it's a safer recovery. That dog was bad when he came in. He's going to be better when the surgery's over, but he needs recovery time with a nice open airway tracheostomy for one or two days. Then you can challenge, uh, challenge him by pulling out the, the tracheostomy. But these noisy dogs routine, you know, I don't really think you need to do that. You can, but I, I just don't really think it's, it's necessary in all dogs. Here's his overlong soft palate. Here is his epiglottis. Here is the base of his tongue. Here's his tonsillar crypt. Can't quite see it on this side, but we're, we're pretty magnified. So that's your anatomy. I'm sure you all did splendidly. Now here's those DeBakey forceps. These guys are uh, pretty awesome. Um, if you do any kind of um, visceral organ surgery in your practice, probably wouldn't be a bad idea. Okay. Um, let's do. Yeah, these aren't going to break the bank. Uh, but here's a 10 incher on eBay for nine bucks. You don't want that guy. I kind of like the ones with the gold handle because it makes it easier to see on the table. I don't see any gold handles yet. Um, so again, they're not, they're not gonna break the bank, man. So they might be something that you would be interested in and in maybe uh, checking that out. He 
these little ribbon retractors, they're not going to break the bank either. Um, this one looks expensive, but you get seven. And they come in a wide variety of widths. And so the clear advantage, if you're uh, interested in a broad, malleable ribbon retractor, is that they do come in a, a broad range of widths. So be careful when you're ordering that they tell you exactly the width that you're getting. The other thing about DeBakey's is you need to think about the width of the tip. The width of the tip should be no, no smaller than two millimeters, but I think three millimeter width is much more universally uh, usable, user-friendly. Now, here's what we're gonna do. Th this is not tricky. It's, well, it's tricky because you're in a hole and you're working with instruments that are long and you don't do this very often. But the bottom line is everybody knows how to sew. So that sort of helps. So let's start at this side and let's put in a stay suture. Now let's talk about this stay suture for a second. This stay suture will stay with the dog. So when I cut his palette, I'm gonna cut on this side of this stay suture. And so the location of this stay suture is extremely important. So when you're placing it, visualize the location of your blue dot. Look at where his palette sort of attaches to his, to his um, airway and place your stay suture right at the, that connection. Very important. Leave this end long, don't cut this end and leave this end with the needle. I'm right-handed, so I'm gonna suture uh, from the dog's left to the dog's right. So I'm leaving the needle here. I'm putting a pair of mosquito hemostats on this guy, and I'm putting those mosquito hemostats out his mouth, and they're hanging down, so it's pulling his palate this way. Good job. So then <clears throat> we need to manipulate his soft palate, but we don't want to have an instrument or a hand in the way. So we're going to put stay suture number two at the tip of his palate, put a mosquito hemostat on that. And for now, you can just hang that out of his mouth. Make sure your, your um, stay suture that's in his palate, this guy right here, is long enough that the suture is completely out of his mouth. <clears throat> you, or that his instrument is completely out of his mouth. That way you don't have to fight <clears throat> that instrument when you're doing uh, the rest of your work. And then go to the opposite side and check out where your uh, stay suture is on this side. Then come over to this side and make it as symmetric as possible tie at least four throws, leave those two ends long, put those two ends and make sure you tie that. Leave those two ends long and hang, <coughs> hang that outside of his, his uh, oral cavity. And so now basically what you do is you have this palette stretched out this way and then you have the um, tip of his palate coming out his mouth. So there's tension. So you now have something that you can actually cut against without chasing his palate all over the inside of his mouth. So it, it, it really helps to have these stay sutures. And I know that veterinarians don't like to waste suture, but <clears throat> I don't think you'll find it to be a waste at all. The soft palate in all dogs is muscular. It, it, it has uh, a mechanism and the mechanism isn't just a flip floppy piece of mucosa. It is a muscle encased in mucosa. So he's got his 
uh, nasal side of his mucosa and he has his oral side of his mucosa. So when you cut, cut about a third of the palate off and then stop. Go back and identify these two layers and make sure that you engage those two layers in every suture that you place. That way you will close over that muscle that's gonna bleed. It's a striated muscle, it has a rich blood supply and it's going to bleed. And so the best way to control the hemorrhage is suture pressure, those two edges snugly sutured together will occlude and the bleeding will subside, the bleeding will stop. So only cut a third, keep an eye on your blue dot, keep everything organized. Here you can see these two layers are coming up a little bit nicer. You can see them there, it's good. And just a little bit, and this is why you want a curved met is because it just makes it a little easier to get your arm in there with that nice gentle curve and the length of the medicine bomb to keep your hands out of the dog's mouth. Awesome. So we're gonna use a multi-filament synthetic absorbable suture. I'm using Vicryl here. Dex, um, Dexon Vicryl Polysorb would all be excellent choices. And I am engaging both of those layers of mucosa. So here's his oral side and then reaching in to get his nasal side. Boom. <clears throat> Try to keep your sutures no further apart than two millimeters. Now watch this cool little trick. Okay, watch this. When you're doing continuous, which is what we're doing here, when you pull your suture down, that loop of suture can go wherever it wants. But you need it to be perfectly perpendicular in order to guarantee that you're gonna have an airtight, watertight seal. So watch what we do with our needle. The needle is gonna hook that loop and then you're gonna use this needle to guide the loop so that it goes exactly where you want it. Oh yeah, that little move. If you can remember that little move, it's, it, it, it makes a big difference. I use that in any visceral organ that I'm suturing together. So intestine, bladder, I'm always careful to make sure the loop of my continuous pattern comes down exactly perpendicular. <clears throat> So cut, so cut, so cut, so. Once you've gotten the first four or five sutures and you have engaged mucosa on both sides, it becomes a little easier to do. So just take the time on these first four or five sutures to make sure that you're, you're getting them exactly where you want. <clears throat> and suture all the way across to the end. I'm using probably something like 3.0 or 4.0 um, Vicryl. I'm using a cutting needle because it goes through this mucosa a little easier than a taper. And then I'm gonna tie my final suture to one of these strands of his stay suture. So you don't have that pesky three strand um, closure at the end of the continuous. This is a nice, neat, and I put a few extra throws in so that I can cut these ends close to the knot. So I'd probably put six throws minimum and then cut close to the knot, as opposed to having two flags that can be irritants for the poor little dog and cut this guy off. <clears throat> and then I just, I do a little sneaky move here where I take his epiglottis and I just go, yeah, is that, yeah, 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 it looks good. Now, admittedly, he's distorted because his tongue's pulled halfway out of his mouth, but you know, it's close. So uh, nose, there's a number of ways you, that you can successfully do the nose. 
and I've done them all. And this is the way I'm doing them now. I went to a, uh, oh, it was that same airway talk where Brendan McKernan was there. It was the same airway talk. And this gal was doing a project on uh, nasal planum resections. And she did this pro project which mimicked an article that was written in the AVMA journal back in the 60s, <laughs> it's the 60s, where this guy, this surgeon had taken this whole piece of tissue out as the nasal planum resection. And it fell into disfavor because of the hemorrhage. So what people did, and I'll show you this technique as well, so what people did is they took a wedge out and then sutured this back over. And, and that's fun. I, I, that's what I've been doing forever. But then uh, uh, Brendan McKern and you know, back to this physiology that nobody likes to remember. Brendan McKernan said, he said, Howie, if you take a diameter, like you take this diameter and you increase it by X, well, let's increase it a lot. You increase it by X. You increase the flow through that diameter by X to the fourth power, X times X times X times X. So you don't have to take out much tissue at all to create a tremendous improvement in flow, airway flow. So if you, let's go back to this guy. <clears throat> so if you take a wedge out of here, <clears throat> And then sew this back over here. Well, this piece you just sewed back, you're including him X to the fourth. Because if you'd have just taken this piece out completely, then he's got X to the fourth more airway and it makes a difference. And, and I didn't believe it. And this gal did a, <coughs> excuse me, a really nice study that showed that, that, that it worked and, and Nobody would argue that it works. Here's what you would argue. If you core this out of here, is the scar tissue going to be white or does he get his pigment back? And in her article, she showed that he gets his pigment back. So we're going to do this little guy. And it'll, it's going to freak some of you guys out because it freaked me out because I am one of those surgeons that was taught to believe in hemostasis and to try to provide a method of hemostasis whenever possible. And of course the flap allows you to provide hemostasis. But what we're gonna do here is take a number 11 blade and you gotta go deep. You can't just cut this little piece off. That piece goes into his, <clears throat> his, his nose, his nasal cavity. And this is a great place for your uh, brown essence because this is collagen dense. So you need a good grip. You need to be able to control this piece. Look how deep we're going. So you do need to go wide, you do need to go deep, but do try to get it um, cosmetic. So you, you, you want them to breathe, but the owners will go, wait a minute, wait a minute, one side's bigger than the other, or what did you do to my dog's nose? So a little um, upfront uh, work with the client to let them know what you're doing, what to expect. Um, and the, the, the dogs do great. And, and, and do know, this is a capillary bleeding. These dogs have normal clotting cascades. They're going to clot. Um, they're gonna need a little bit of help. Don't put any products in. Don't <clears throat> put ice in or epinephrine or any of that stuff. These dogs aren't, they don't need the help. They don't want the help and don't silver nitrate them. Man, that, oof, that's gonna hurt. And, it, and they don't need it. It's, it's added chemical trauma and chemical burning that they, that they don't really need to have. So that, and, and do this first, do the nose first, stuff the nose with uh, gauze, and then do the palate second. 
it just gives the nose a little bit of time to to um, to stop bleeding. Here he is. He's still a little groggy. I wanted to get this shot. He's about two hours after uh, extubation. He's got a little uh, serum coming down his nose, which you would expect. He's panting because he's on some form of opioid um, that's jacking up his, his respiration, but he wasn't noisy, which I thought was interesting. Here he is uh, the next day. He's got the collar on because he tried to take his, his IVs out. And now, did you memorize the look of his nose at the beginning? Look at this. You can drive a truck in there. You can drive a Mac truck in there. And he's symmetric. That's, that's the key <clears throat> is if you can maintain symmetry um that's what the, that's what clients want the dog wants an open airway so the dog doesn't look in the mirror in the morning the dog doesn't really care about his nose well, he cares about his nose but doesn't care about what his nose looks like this is a more traditional um wedge technique and, and like i say it's fine there's there's nothing wrong with it but it is not as airway efficient as removing um, the whole um, alar part of his nasal planum, and that that woman's, um, I think she was an intern at Michigan. Her article pretty much caught my attention because I, I was I was worried that these uh, the scar tissue would be more of a a whitish scar tissue that would replace the cord out nose. And that's not, that doesn't happen. She proved that in her, in her article. In fact, I'll show you, uh, her, her article was um, done in these uh, pugs, shih tzus, um, uh, Boston's um, that come in with nasal noise. So the airway noise is all nasal. They come into your wellness clinic, they're making noise. You recommend that something be done at the time of their neuter. Dog comes in to be neutered. You do a exam. The palate's normal. So you'll do the technique that we did on the Frenchie. You'll do that at the time of the neuter, do it first. And then it'll be it'll, it'll stop bleeding by the time you're done with the neuter. So here's her technique. In fact, this is a video she uh, lent me, and and said I could use it. So this is uh, youth at the wellness clinic getting castrated and getting the nose done first. So it's exactly the way we did it. These little guys are small. And so, you know, you don't take a lot out, but think about X to the fourth. And doing a flap in a dog this size, you can do it, absolutely. But, you know, I just, I wonder how efficient that it's, that it's gonna be. So here's, I took a couple of slides. This is her article. Uh, this was the cosmetics at two weeks down the road and all the um, clients who had this done in her paper um, said that they were very happy with the ultimate result. Um, last but not least, um, everted saccules. We've, we got, we've, we're doing business a little differently with everted saccules than I have in the past. And that is that we usually don't remove them in dogs that are just noisy. They will go back on their own. They are innocent bystanders and they, they'll go back on their own. They're not abnormal. They're just being sucked out of their uh, little home. 
But if you have a respiratory cripple, you got to get that airway open as wide and as safely as you can. So I reach in with a pair of ex extubate the dog. And I have a pair of cup biopsy forceps that nobody can use except me. Because if these aren't sharp, they're, they're almost useless. So I'll take this cup biopsy for I mean, uterine biopsy forceps equine type deal reach in there and cut. If you're having trouble getting it to come out, you can slip a blade behind it to help you out. Reintubate and inflate the cuff a little bit so that the, uh, inflate the cuff so that that'll help a little bit with the, um, with the hemorrhage.